Hi, Donovan. I'm retired military. I was in the army for 30 years. I've seen combat, been shot at, and pretty much done it all. I've also been trained in survival skills and tracking and intelligence gathering. I was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas from 2001 to 2005. In 2003, my unit was deployed to Bagram Airfield near Kabul, Afghanistan. We were there for about six months before we rotated back stateside. While we were there, our platoon would go out and patrol almost every day in the different areas of the country, mostly to gather intel on local Taliban groups and set up observation posts along major roads and trails used by insurgents to move men and supplies around the country. One of these patrols stands out in my mind because it changed my life forever. One day while on patrol with my squad leader, we were ordered by our company commander to check out an area about five miles outside of a small village called Zadran, located southwest of Bagram near the Pakistan border. We were told that villagers had reported seeing strange creatures walking around at night, but nobody believed them. We left the base around midnight and drove to the village. When we arrived, we were greeted by several villagers who told us that they had seen these strange creatures walking around at night, but they didn't know what they were or where they came from. They said these creatures stood about seven feet tall and had these large eyes that glowed red in the dark. They also said these things made very loud screeching sounds when they were agitated. The villagers told us that these creatures would come out at night and chase their animals away from their farms. This was causing them to lose a lot of money because their animals were their main source of income. So they asked if we could do something about it so their animals would stop being chased away. We talked with the villagers for a little while before we decided to go out into the desert and see if we could find the location where these strange things were sighted. My squad leader agreed to take me along because he knew I was an avid hunter and a tracker. We started walking around the perimeter of this village when all of a sudden we heard this loud screeching sound coming from the direction of a valley about a thousand meters away. It was so loud and piercing that it hurt our ears. My squad leader looked at me and said, did you hear that? I replied, yeah, what the hell was that? He told me he didn't know, but it sounded like something big. When we looked over at the valley where we heard the screech, we saw these two red glowing eyes staring back at us. They were so bright that they lit up part of the surrounding area around them. We watched as these eyes moved closer to us until they came into view. And then there were these two seven foot tall creatures that were walking on two legs with very long arms and no clothes on whatsoever. They had this dark gray skin and their eyes really did glow red in the dark like laser sights on a rifle. They were coming right for us. I readied my weapon to fire at them if they got too close. But my squad leader told me, hold my fire because he didn't want to kill them. He wanted to find out what they were and where they came from. As these two creatures approached us, they began to make this loud screeching sound. As these two creatures approached us, it was a terrifying sight. I brought up my weapon because these things were huge. When they got close, they just stood there looking at us and they let out this demonic scream. I'll never forget that scream. Then just like that, they turned and flew away. We missed our chance to shoot those things, but something tells me that they were intelligent. I'm not sure what we saw that night, but I know it wasn't anything from Earth. Now I've been a hunter my entire life. I've never seen anything like that before, or since for that matter. I'm convinced that we were face to face with some type of alien beings. Hi Donovan, I appreciate the chance to tell this story. When I was working as a ranger for the park service, there were stretches of time when I'd be working remotely on my own. This was especially true when I was working in a state park in Wyoming. I was sometimes out for a week or two at a time, 
living out of my RV and collecting field data. I didn't typically encounter much out of the ordinary, except for one time when I was out in the mountains of southern Wyoming. I was off the main road by a couple of miles. I was camped at the edge of this clearing. The open meadow was to the north. There was a thick forest to the east, west, and south. Before sundown, I went into the woods to the east to gather some wood. That area didn't tend to draw many people, since the roads are rough, and it's kind of a local gem that not too many people know about. So it seemed odd when I came upon some sort of structure made from downed trees. The trees were aspen, and they were formed into a structure that was in kind of a mix between a teepee and a lean-to. There were a lot of carvings cut into the aspen trees all around the structure. It was pretty cool. The structure was probably about 20 feet high. The carvings were strange. It wasn't like letters or numbers that I could make out. They mostly seemed like primitive shapes. Seeing this out in a rarely visited location did make me feel kind of cautious, wondering if somebody else was around. It was quite close to where I was setting up camp, but I really wasn't worried. I got what wood I could easily find and went back to build my fire. Usually my campfire dinners were pretty boring, but that time I had my RV fridge stocked with some steaks. So I grilled one up with some potatoes and it smelled incredibly good. After dinner I read for a while and then I went to bed and I fell asleep pretty fast. It was probably only about an hour or so when I woke up to this noise. It was the sound of a small animal scurrying around the campsite. I wasn't too worried. I was kind of wondering if the smell of my dinner might have attracted something. I banged on the wall of the RV and it sounded like the animal ran off. I settled into my blankets and was drifting off when I was suddenly ripped into full consciousness by this loud whooping noise. That's as best as I could describe it. I laid there staring up at the ceiling, listening as the sound kept repeating itself. It would start low and guttural and then it would get higher and incredibly loud, and then it would end abruptly before repeating. Now, I've heard a lot of strange things, but I've never heard that particular kind of call before. It definitely sounded like a call that an animal would use to communicate with. My side window was popped open, so I could hear it clearly through the screen. I sat there thinking about it, and estimated that it was coming from the direction where the structure was. I lifted the blinds a little and looked through the screen. The moon was bright, and I could see someone wobbling around the edge of the trees. I'd say it was about 40 or 50 feet away from me. I couldn't see well at all, but it didn't seem like an animal because it was walking around upright. Now this was miles from a town, and there was no campground nearby at all. I looked at my watch and it was like 1 a.m. So someone is walking around the forest at 1 a.m. during the week. I sat back and watched it lumbering around. It was right near the TP structure. Then it seemed to lean against a tree and squat down like it was using the tree for a backrest. I started getting this whiff of a urine smell and it kept getting stronger. Whoever it was, was facing right toward me. It wasn't moving. It was just sitting there. It sat still for five minutes and didn't move. It didn't shuffle around, nothing. It was completely still. I couldn't relax not knowing what it was. So I grabbed my mag light and stepped out into the RV. I turned on the light to shine it toward the trees and the thing stood up. I was basically screaming, oh shit, in my head. The thing had to be close to eight feet tall. It was like a huge ape. It looked right at me with these reddish eyes. It sure as hell wasn't anything on the list of Wyoming wildlife, I'll tell you that right now. It had really shaggy light brown hair, with just a massive upper body and like a cone shaped head. It lifted its head to make that whooping sound again, and I could see that its face seemed mostly hairless. My adrenaline was rushing, and all I wanted to do was get behind the wheel and drive away. I ran toward the driver's side door and realized I had left my keys inside the RV. I had to go back there and get them, and I was terrified that this thing would come at me and reach me in no time at all. But it stayed where it was, 
and kept howling. As I pulled away, the headlights hit the tree line and I saw it retreat further back into the woods. I didn't waste any time getting out of there. I left half my belongings at that campsite, but I didn't care at all. Like I said, that was the one and only time I spotted something unexplainable, which really actually surprises me, considering how much time I've spent in the wilderness. I was a park ranger at a state park in North Dakota when I was first starting out on the job. There are some real hidden gems in North Dakota. Not a lot of people realize how much the state has to offer. There was a lot of farming and open fields near the park. On my days off, I'd sometimes go walking through them for a change of pace. One day during the summer, I went for a long walk when the field was full of crops ready to be harvested. North Dakota grows a ton of canola probably over a million acres of it. It was really hot that day, somewhere in the 90s. The canola plants had gotten really high. The flowers were bright yellow and looked amazing. I stopped and got out my phone to take some pictures. I stood there for about five minutes messing around trying to get just the right photo to do justice to all those flowers. Then I kept walking and came out of the field and walked onto a dirt path. I turned around to look back across the field and saw what I thought was a person dressed in dark clothing, but then quickly realized it was a scarecrow. It was standing in the middle of this field of yellow, which I thought looked striking. I couldn't believe I didn't notice it on my walk through. I'm not sure how I would have missed it being that it was such a stark contrast to all the yellow. I snapped a quick picture and then kept walking. The path curved around to the right but I looked back one more time before continuing. Then what I thought was a scarecrow started walking too. So now I'm thinking it's obviously not a scarecrow, but a person, maybe the farmer. But why would they be dressed from head to toe in dark clothing on this really hot summer day? They started walking closer and were soon standing on the spot I had originally stopped to take pictures. I started hearing what sounded like a sniffing noise like whoever that was was sniffing all around the spot where I had been standing. I guess that was my first clue that it wasn't a person, but it was standing upright, so it certainly hadn't crossed my mind that it was an animal. I was starting to feel nervous. Now that it was closer to me, it seemed to be really, really tall, abnormally tall, like maybe approaching eight feet. And what I had assumed to be dark clothing I now realized was dark fur. My mind was scrambling to decide what the hell I was dealing with. The area I was in was not known to have bears, which was the only animal I would expect to be able to stand up like that on two legs. Then I started getting hit with this horrible smell, and then I listened as this thing let out a blood-curdling howl. Until then, I had just been mildly curious about who would be walking around out there. But when I heard that howl, I was scared shitless. I started worrying that the thing was going to become interested in me and hunt me down. I was really panicking. I had very little recourse and didn't know what to do. My truck was probably two miles up the road and there was no one around at all. I wasn't armed at the time, but let's just say I learned my lesson that day. Now I never go anywhere unarmed. The thing seemed to have turned toward me, and though I couldn't see it very well, I could feel that it was staring at me. It seemed to have a massive head and a huge upper body. All I could think to do was to start waving my arms around and jumping up and down and screaming as loud as I could. I just went completely ballistic and started acting like I was completely insane. I mean, I tore my throat up with how loud I was screaming. It kept looking toward me and actually came a few steps closer. I just increased my insanity and then it seemed to come to a decision and turn back toward the direction it had come from. I kept yelling until it was almost out of sight and then I tore out of there toward my truck. When I got there, I was completely spent. I was sweating profusely and felt completely wrung out. All I could do was sit in the truck gasping and heaving. It took me a good 10 minutes until I was able to drive. None of it made any sense. 
The feeling I got from that thing was definitely malevolent. I couldn't understand for the life of me what could possibly have attracted it to a field of flowers, for God's sake. The picture I had gotten just looked like a dark lump of something. Really poor quality. Sadly, that was the end of my habit of walking around in a golden daydream. I have spent weeks listening to your channel. I have listened to so many accounts of inexplicable happenings. It has taken me a long time to work up the willpower to talk about my experience. I prefer not to bring it up often because I don't want it to be real. And I'm afraid if it happened once, it could happen again. But here I am telling you anyway. This event took place when I had been a ranger for about a year. When I first started out, I was single and only had to think of myself. I could make just about any accommodations work. That was back in the early 2000s. I honestly never thought I would find a significant other. But then I ended up meeting just the right person, out of the blue. I was working in the Medicine Bow Rut National Forest at the time. While we were engaged, I was still living in a pretty primitive situation. So it wasn't the best setup for our social life. But we spent plenty of time together during my time off. We both loved to hike a lot, and one of our first trips together was camping in the spot we loved, a bit east of the National Forest. It was quiet and off the beaten path. It was a great place to get away from everyone and recharge. The first night we were there, it was a little stormy, so we didn't sleep that great. But the next day started off much calmer. We wanted to drive to a neighboring peak that I had heard about, so on the second morning of our trip, we headed that way. There were supposed to be several different trails and quite a few campsites in the area, but there was one trail that went to an alpine lake that we wanted to check out. We drove for about an hour to get to the place. When we got there, it seemed weird that most of the campsites were empty. I had heard that the area was usually very popular but there were only a couple spots taken. One of the sites had an old broken down tent and seemed to be kind of trashed. The other occupied site had an old man cooking something over his fire. When we pulled up, he gave us a look like we were trespassing or something. There was an old truck and a Jeep in the parking area. We parked and started getting our stuff together. I was getting pretty weird vibes from this place, even though I heard good things about it. It seemed to have gone downhill since the last time I looked at the reviews. We went searching for the trail and finally found a path after looking around for a while. The path was easy to follow, but the switchbacks were really steep. It really gave us a workout. We made it up there and enjoyed the beautiful view. It took some pictures. We hung out there for a while and had a snack and talked about our plan for the next day. When we started heading down, we got about halfway and all of a sudden, everything got completely silent. We couldn't hear a sound. No birds, no bugs, no wind, nothing. It was a very large and abrupt, obvious change. And we felt this incredibly oppressive feeling that just surrounded and pressed in on us with this heavy force. It makes me shudder to think about it now. I somehow felt like we were being trapped, even though we were surrounded by open space. My fiance and I looked at each other, and we both had fear in our eyes. We started running downhill, but the feeling seemed to follow us. We were coming around one of the switchbacks when we heard this ungodly shriek. And then, the air seemed to be filled with an immense dark shadow. It didn't seem possible, but it felt like a huge cloak was being dropped over us. Out of nowhere. I saw something flapping slowly like the wings of a giant bird, but I only got a glance at it before I must have blacked out. I don't know how to describe it except it was moving through the air in a very unusual way, and it seemed to be the source of the silence that had fallen over everything. It felt like a void of complete emptiness. I remember trying to outrun it, but knowing that it was impossible, it was probably only a few seconds before it overtook my mind and shut me down. Then we came back to our senses. We were back sitting in our car. I looked at my watch and four hours have gone by, twice the length of time 
it would have taken us to get down the trail. I have no idea if we actually lost consciousness or somehow that our memory of those hours eradicated. My fiance and I compared the experiences. They were identical. When we woke up, we felt completely disoriented. I looked around and the same truck and jeep were parked nearby. The old man was still sitting outside of his tent, but now he had his back to us. We just sat there in disbelief, trying to understand what had happened to us. But there was no understanding it. It was like something out of a bizarre fairy tale. I guess the only thing comforting us, if you could call it that, was that we had experienced the same thing. So we either weren't crazy, or we're both completely crazy. Some of the stories I've heard on here have made me feel less alone at least. My fiance and I did end up getting married, and we still like to hike, but we had moved away from that area where that happened. I wouldn't consider going back there ever again. I was working for the United States Forest Service in the Blood Mountain Wilderness. If you don't know, that's the wilderness area in Georgia. About 10 miles of the Appalachian Trail runs through it. The wilderness area can be rugged in some parts, but we try to maintain it well for the visitors. We have a healthy population of black bears in the area, so that's a major concern. My experience happened in the late 90s. We had several reports about black bears bothering dispersed campers, Despite using proper bear precautions, I did some night patrols of the area to see if I could find the bear responsible. I was driving along one of the access roads in the park when I saw something moving in a ditch. It looked like the outline of a bear. It was fixed on something in the ditch. I shined a spotlight to get a better look. I couldn't see its face, only its back, but I could see that it was eating something. It looked like a deer carcass, but I wasn't certain from that angle. I stayed in my vehicle, but I rolled down the window and tried to scare it off. Bears can be aggressive around food, and we weren't too far from an area with frequent campers. I screamed, honked the horn, and waved my light around, but the animal didn't seem to notice or care. I had a signal flare in my truck. I lit it and threw it at what I thought was a large black bear. The flare hit the animal in the back, and it finally turned around. I could see it wasn't a bear at all. Its face was illuminated red by the flare that was burning at its feet. It was a wolf, a gigantic black wolf. I'm not joking when I say that it was the size of an adult black bear, maybe even larger. Its eyes were a yellowish amber color, and its teeth looked too big for its mouth like those Ice Age creatures you read about in books. I had clearly pissed it off. It was staring right at me through the window. I honked a horn at it, but the creature didn't care. I, I can't tell you how fast I rolled up my window, but the animal didn't go to the driver's side window like I thought it was going to. It walked right in front of my truck. If I thought the wolf was big before, it was enormous now. It stood in front of my truck, like it dared me to hit it. It would have been like hitting an elk. I knew my truck couldn't take that kind of damage, and I think the wolf did too. I knew I had to get out of there, but it was blocking the road. I slammed the truck into reverse and spun around as quick as I could. The wolf didn't budge. I watched the entire time in my mirror, but here's the creepy part, as if seeing a giant wolf creature wasn't frightening enough. As I was driving away, I watched the wolf in my rear view mirror and it stood up on its hind feet, just like a bear. I got back to the ranger station and locked myself inside. I called my supervisor and I told him about the wolf and he didn't believe me. He said I must have been tired and it was probably just a bear or a stray dog. I don't blame him, but it was frustrating. The whole thing sounded absurd, but I know what I saw and it wasn't a bear, and it wasn't just some stray dog. On my drive home that night, I was too afraid to even look out the window at the forest. I was so afraid I would see that thing's face out there. Somehow, I managed to get inside the safety of my house. I didn't sleep at all that night. 
I went back to the ranger station in the morning, and what I saw there will haunt me for the rest of my life. All around the perimeter of the station were footprints, wolf footprints to be exact, except they were the size of a bear's. It had followed me all the way back that night. I showed my supervisor the prints when I got to the station, but he accused me of playing an elaborate prank. Since the prints were obviously canine shaped, but they were entirely too large. I tried to track where the creature went, but it covered its tracks well. It was like it wanted me to see that it was there, but it didn't want me to know where it went off to. I was terrified. If that thing managed to follow me back to the station that night, it could have followed me back to my house. I don't imagine walls or locked doors could stop an animal like that if it really wanted to get in. I ended up transferring to a different area and finding an apartment nearer the city. I just couldn't sleep knowing that that thing was nearby. I never found out exactly what it was. It was just a giant wolf or it was some sort of unknown creature. Whatever it was, it was extremely smart. I keep thinking back to that moment in the truck. It knew I wouldn't hit it if it stood in front of me. It knew I couldn't. It managed to follow me back to the ranger station, but that's all it did. It put quite a bit of effort into scaring me, but it didn't try to attack. If it wanted me dead, it had its chance then. I don't know what to think of it. I know I never want to see it again, and you won't ever catch me anywhere near Blood Mountain. I can tell you that. We were attacked. I know that sounds ominous and a little stupid, but that's what it was. It was a siege. They hit us hard and fast, and before we knew what was happening, they were gone. I wish I could say we were in a castle. I wish I could say we were behind walls that were defendable or sturdy. We were in a mobile home. I was parked out in Arizona at the time, right on the edge of the desert. I think I was trespassing, technically. I'm sure I was on reservation land. I didn't mess with no one, and no one messed with me. It was ideal for someone in my situation, with too much social anxiety and not enough distractions. Somehow, out in the middle of nowhere, I even made a few friends. Tom and George were the closest things I had to friends anyway. That's not their real name, of course, but I promise you that their real names are just as bland. You wouldn't know that they descended straight from the natives and still lived on the land of their forefathers who fought colonization to the bitter end. Maybe they didn't have enough distractions either. Why else would they have been partying with me in a rundown mobile home? We had a nice fire going. It burned most of the night. We had a few drinks, danced around it, and George even brought over a few of his single friends. They left early. I'm glad George and Tom stuck around although I'm not sure they'd say the same. I'm sure they wished they had left me alone out there that night. They wouldn't have had to see what I saw. They wouldn't have had to fight. It must have been 2 a.m. when we heard them, something scurrying outside of the vehicle. We were at a table inside playing a round of cards. Tom heard them first. His eyes were on the windows before we could guess why. He went outside with a baseball bat to scare away coyotes. That's what we figured they were, you know. Coyotes come around sometimes. They scram when you start getting loud. Tom could get loud too. Watching him get all animated always made George and I laugh. We followed him outside after a few moments. I remember George asking if we missed the show. When our feet hit the dirt, Tom was already quiet. But Tom didn't answer. He didn't turn back. He was staring at something on the other side of the dim fire. We looked over his shoulders to see what it was. It was a man, I think. Maybe. I think they were people. People raised by the desert. I guess people raised by wolves? The man animal was naked and crouching on the ground. We couldn't see his face through the licking flames. George yelled to scare him off, and another man creature scurried up to join the first. This one was a female. We saw her face. It was shaped like a bat or a rodent or something. Her nose split open like a blooming flower. 
Her teeth were awkward and her lips were pulled back to expose a quarter inch of gums on the top and bottom of her mouth. If she had eyes, I didn't see them. George got quiet. I was the first one to turn tail. I wasn't sticking around to write a report for National Geographic. Tom followed and George came in last. He locked the door. We stood there staring at it, huffing, for what must have been a full minute. Then something slammed against the door. It wasn't dull like flesh. It was hard and cracked when it hit the paneling. We found out the next morning that it was a log from the fire. They grabbed it out of there while it was still burning. Then came the stones. It sounded like hail at first. Hail and howling wolves. As the creatures whooped and screamed outside, they pelted the mobile home with whatever they could find. The windows cracked, shattered. We were worried they'd be smart enough to burn us out. They weren't, or maybe they weren't trying to kill us at all. Who knows? Maybe it was just a show of strength. We fought to keep our door barricaded and the windows blocked. One of the rocks sailed in and struck George in the temple. He didn't go down, but his legs wobbled after that. Tom kept yelling back. I doubt the beasts outside spoke any of the languages that Tom did. He threatened them anyway. The things got braver, even if they didn't get smarter. Eventually, the tin-like thuds of the stones and logs was replaced by the slap of the creature's palms. They smacked the walls like they could force their way in. If they tried the door, they probably could have. An hour later, it was silent. We heard them run back to wherever they came from, back to the mystery of the desert. When we opened the door, they were gone, but the walls of my mobile home were dented and covered in dirty handprints. Mud from the desert earth, blood, and other bodily fluids streaked across the vehicle like paint. None of us spoke that morning. We cleaned up together. We washed the walls with a rag, a gallon of water, and half a bottle of vodka. We worked in absolute silence until the evidence of that night before was scrubbed from existence. We didn't want to look at it at all. We wanted to pretend it was a dream. The boys left after that. I stuck around until the sun went down, and I thought I heard noises outside, and I left right away. I had the vehicle towed. The company that grabbed it fined me for the condition of the mobile home. Apparently, it was covered in dirt again. The inside was tossed, covered in the smell of animals and excrement. I sold it as soon as I could. This is the truth, though. That's the story of what happened. When I wake up tomorrow, I'm sure I won't have the courage to talk about it again. If I can ask three questions. What do you think they were? Why us? And why then? As a cop, I spend a lot of time out in the streets. I work in a fairly small town, so we typically have pretty predictable nights. I work in West Texas, where I grew up. It was around Christmas time, and my partner and I had been out patrolling for several hours, and we were having a pretty uneventful shift. It was really cold and windy out. It felt like anything that wasn't nailed down was getting blown around. We had to stop for gas at the same station we always used. The department had a credit card set up with a particular gas station, so we always used that one. We weren't in an isolated part of town, but there were wooded areas here and there. It was on a moderately busy road where there were a lot of apartment buildings. We had just left the gas station and we were coming up to an intersection with a stop sign where we were going to turn left and head toward the police station. I was in the passenger seat just looking out my window, and my partner said, they must be crazy to be out jogging in this wind. I looked over to see that as we were approaching the intersection, someone had just come out of the trees to the left and was about to run across the road. I did a double take and said, wow, that guy's really tall. As he left the sidewalk, I realized he was running hunched over and had these incredibly long arms that stretched down past his knees. Then, as he came further into the light, I was shocked to see that it wasn't a guy at all, but something sickly thin and pale and without clothing. It was a grayish color all over, 
and everything about it was just wrong. It had these giant hands and long fingers. It was moving in this twitchy manner, but at a high rate of speed. We had come to a stop under the streetlight, and it had just run across and came to a stop right before the sidewalk. This thing was standing with its back towards us, and it was hunched forward with its arms stretched behind itself. It was probably six and a half feet tall, and its head was kind of shaped like an upside-down teardrop. By then, my partner had started to move the car forward while we were trying to make sense of what we were seeing. We were going to do a U-turn and come back around behind the thing when all of a sudden, it did the fastest 180 you can imagine and was coming straight at us from behind. I have never felt such intense fear. My partner's instinct was to floor the car while trying to figure out how to maneuver into a position to get at this creature. It all happened so fast. It's hard to describe how it was all going down, but I heard the car screeching as it accelerated. I looked behind us and saw that the thing was keeping up with us, even though we were going like 50 miles per hour. I radioed for backup, and finally, when we were going about 60, the thing started to drop behind. I know what you're probably thinking. Why didn't you just shoot it? But the thing was supernaturally fast, and we were in a bad position. Plus, we were just trying to figure out what the hell we had entered with the sighting of this nightmare creature. We got to a place where we could turn the car around, and my partner accelerated back toward the direction of the thing while I had my gun drawn. But then, we saw nothing. It all happened in a matter of seconds to minutes, and at the speed we were going, we should have met it in the road. We saw nothing, but when we approached where we had first sighted it, this incredible fear came over me. The car came to a stop, and I turned to my partner, and we were just staring at each other. I just kept saying, you're not crazy. I saw it too. After a few minutes, I finally started to get a grip on myself again. We assumed that when we pulled away from it, it must have turned around and went off in the other direction, down one of the roads. Then, out of nowhere, a group of deer came running from the direction where we were headed. They were running down the middle of the road towards us and swarmed past us like we weren't even there. There were like seven or eight of them, and I had never seen deer run like that so tightly together in a group. It definitely felt like they were running from something. We were sure that that creature had gone in that direction, and that's what had caused those deer to run towards us like that. Our backup arrived, and it was pretty wild trying to describe to them what had happened. A lot of searching went on that night, but we came up empty-handed. But after that night, I was a bit of a nervous wreck. I kept thinking I saw something out of the corner of my eye. My partner and I had to keep reassuring each other that we'd be able to get back to normal. I still have dreams about that thing. That grotesque, tall, thin body with a teardrop-shaped head. This might all sound nuts, but I figured I could at least reach out to you on your channel and there would be other people with a similar experience. I hate that I saw that thing. It made me feel insecure, and like there are way more dangerous things out there than the common criminals I was used to dealing with. But as with anything, trauma fades with time, I guess. But I sure wish we had caught that thing that night and gotten it put away. It seems like these days, people who have had UFO sightings are much more likely to be believed. I mean, the government has essentially admitted that they're a fact, right? But back when this happened, you were considered a real clown if you talked about having any kind of strange, otherworldly encounter. So I never talked about what I saw, especially seeing as how I was on the force. People wanted their police officers to be no-nonsense and trustworthy. It didn't help that the other witness had been pulled over for drinking. If you can believe it, I didn't even tell my spouse. I mean, we're just regular, everyday kind of people. I didn't want something like that to make everything weird. I'd been a cop in a small town for a long time, and I had a reputation to uphold. This probably happened around 15 years ago. 
I had gotten a call out to the local bar to break up an argument that was about to turn into a fight. I know, it sounds like the Wild West or something, but it was actually outside of Philadelphia. I knew the guys who were getting into it, so I was able to talk some sense into them. After I got the problem handled, I was back out cruising the streets when I noticed someone driving a little erratically. It wasn't even a weekend, but apparently everyone had decided to go out and get sloshed that night. I pulled him over and asked him if he had been drinking. He said he'd had one drink. I got his license and registration and went back to the cruiser to run his information. It was taking a while, probably because it was a full moon and everyone was acting up. I was watching out of my windshield when I saw the guy jump out of his vehicle and squat down behind his car door like it was a shield. I chirped my siren and called over the loudspeaker for him to get back in his vehicle. He didn't even look at me or anything. He just pointed to the sky. The road was such that there was a hill on the left side and a river on the right side. I was looking where he was pointing, and from above the tree line on the hill, I saw an amber light on a triangular craft. I got out of the car and stared up at it. The light was exceedingly bright and shifted back and forth, almost like a searchlight. The triangle was stationary over the trees. I could tell it was triangular because I could see it outlined against the moonlit sky. There were three lights on the bottom at each point of the triangle. The guy that I had stopped got up from his crouch and sprinted over to me. I guess he expected me to save him or something. The triangle slowly started moving forward. It passed over us and it was absolutely silent. It was moving very slowly and gave me the feeling that it was recording everything in the environment. Then the amber light pointed down like a spotlight. It pointed straight down toward the ground. That's when I started feeling really worried. That amber light was bizarre. Whatever it shone on seemed to turn this bluish, greenish color. I was really, really hoping it wouldn't shine on us. Thinking back on it now, I feel like somewhat of an idiot. I can't believe we just stood there, gawking at it. Instead of at least taking cover in the vehicle, the spotlight went out and then the craft moved. Fast. Very fast. It moved to the south faster than you could blink an eye. Distance and size and everything was difficult to gauge, but it looked like it moved at least a mile and maybe two within a second or two. There was no noise, no engine noise of any kind. I don't know of any aircraft that could move like that. We had heard nothing except for my car engine idling beside us. All of its lights shut off, but before I knew it, it had reappeared above us. We all of a sudden saw the black triangle pretty up close while it hovered there. To me, it looked airplane sized or slightly larger. Each side was maybe about 150 feet long. It suddenly came straight down very quickly and stopped about 100 yards above the ground. But the air around us and the trees were all perfectly still. After two or three seconds of pure disbelief, an overwhelming sense of fear took over. That's when both of us scrambled into the cruiser and locked the doors. I don't think I ever knew before that once shaking like a leaf felt like. I could sense the thing up above, and I was honestly just waiting for the car to start beaming up into the air. The craft came back into sight above the windshield, and then shot off to the east. It was easily the fastest moving object I've ever seen. That thing had to be going 1,000 miles an hour due to the speed and brilliance of it. I had no real idea how high up it was. It came to a stop, and the stoplight blinked off and on again for about three seconds. Then the spotlight went out, and the craft moved off. This time, we didn't see it stop anywhere. It was just gone. Me and this guy just sat there in silence. Finally, I grabbed his shoulder and turned him toward me. I put his license into his shirt pocket and said, "You." need to go straight freaking home. Right now. Am I clear? He blubbered a yes sir and took off running to his car. I've never again seen anything like that. I will never forget it. I was working for the fish and game service when I was sent out to the Four Corners area of the San Juan River. There had been a couple of anonymous reports. 
about an injured animal crawling around the banks of the river. The whole situation started out strange. We never had anonymous reports, unless it was about poaching. There was no reason for it. I mean, who anonymously calls fish and game about an unknown injured animal and refuses to reveal their identity? The other strange thing was that the reports refused to identify the type of animal. They both claimed they weren't sure what it was and would not even try to describe it. They wouldn't tell me what color it was or how many legs it had or if it had wings or not. They just said it was an animal of some sort and it looked injured. They both provided the location of the animal, but that was it. I had no idea what I was walking into. The only thing I knew for certain was that, by judging by the time of the reports, the animal looked to be heading downriver. The area of the river I was headed to was deep in a canyon and would require quite a bit of hiking to reach. I drove as far as I could with my truck. I passed some military vehicles on the way out, but I didn't think anything of it at the time. They were parked maybe half a mile from where I left my truck. I began to hike the river. It was midday before I reached it, and it was absolutely sweltering hot. I knew the odds of me finding this animal were not great, but I had two unrelated reports about it, so I had to check it out. And frankly, I was more curious about what kind of animal it was. Miraculously, I found a blood trail almost right away. I couldn't believe it. It was very faint and almost invisible against the red rocks, but there it was. I followed that blood trail for nearly two miles, and it took me most of the day. It would transition from a strong trail that made me think the creature was mortally wounded to just a drip here and there. The sun was beginning to set, and I still had no idea what I was following. I knew I had to turn back soon and get out of the canyon before dark. I pulled out my GPS and recorded the coordinates so I could begin my search back here at the last sign of blood first thing in the morning. And just as I was entering the coordinates into my notebook, I heard an ungodly screech. It was unlike anything I had ever heard before in my life. I can't even really describe it. The closest thing I can relate to it is maybe the call of a hawk. Whatever it was, it was clearly in distress, and it sounded like it was right around the corner. I grabbed my flashlight out of my pack and ran toward the screech. I don't know what I expected to find over there, but it definitely wasn't the scene I was confronted with. There were six men in military uniforms. They looked like army to me, but I wasn't certain. They were all armed, and laying on the ground next to them was a creature caught in a net. Now, I know this is going to sound insane, but it looked like some type of dinosaur. It was hard to get a good look at it because it was all crumpled up beneath the net. I could definitely see that parts of its face had scales, and its eyes looked like reptilian eyes. It looked like there were wings with feathers on it as well, but I couldn't say for certain. The animal was bleeding from a wound that looked to be on its side, and I understood why the people who called it in didn't want to describe it. How do you describe it without sounding crazy? I wish I got a better look at the creature. I had only a minute before the men saw me and threw a piece of canvas over the animal to hide it from view. They asked me what I was doing and I told them. I told them I had a report of an injured animal and was tracking it down. They told me they were out on a training exercise and found an injured condor. That's what they claimed was beneath the tarp. A condor. A very sick condor. They said a wildlife rehabilitator was going to meet them at the top of the canyon and take the condor to a raptor center. They knew that I knew they were lying. If it was, in fact, a condor, it would have been turned over to me. But I knew better than to argue with them. I so badly wanted to call them out, but I didn't know how far they were willing to go to cover this up. So I said good luck with the condor and told them I was going to head back to my truck before it got too dark. I wasn't surprised when they sent two of their men to escort me to my vehicle. 
It was a long hike, and I tried to make lighthearted conversation, but they weren't having it. I don't know what that creature was, or where it originally came from, but I do know there was a significant effort to cover up its existence. I did a little bit of digging after the fact. I couldn't find much information on the internet, but there are a few locals around the southwest that are willing to talk about it. No one really knows what they are, but there have been more than a few sightings of strange creatures in the skies around here. I spent the last 17 years on the police force in various towns in Arizona and Nevada. I've got family in that area, so I never ventured too far away from home, even for a better paying job. I've seen a lot of things over the years, but there is one incident that stuck with me, one that I can't explain. I was working in a smaller town near Kofa Wildlife Refuge. It was about a two hours drive from Phoenix. Most of the towns around that area tend to be smaller and for the most part quieter. I had just spent the last eight years working in the suburbs of Phoenix and I was ready for something a little less crazy. But sometimes the desert can be a strange place when you stray from the more populated areas. I received three calls on one day regarding some type of property damage with unknown causes. It was the absolute dead of summer you could fry an egg on the sidewalk at noon. Growing up in the desert, you'd think I'd be used to the heat, but there are days when it's just brutal and there's no way around it. All of my calls claimed the damage was done overnight. One was from the owner of a goat farm. The other was from an elderly woman living in an old 1970s style trailer. And the final call was from the township. Now property damage isn't usually an urgent matter. Oftentimes, there's nothing we can really do besides file a report, but I didn't have anything else on my agenda that day, so I set to work checking out the complaints. All of the locations were within a 15-mile radius, but the town hall was just around the corner, so I headed there first. There was already a crew of workers there when I arrived at 7.30 a.m. The water tower had somehow been punctured. It was the strangest thing I'd ever seen. It looked like there were claw marks down the side of the tank. I climbed the ladder to get a closer look, thinking I could find some explanations if I saw the damage up close. It looked like something straight out of Jurassic Park. Let me tell you, water towers these days are either made of steel or concrete, or both. I could fire my gun at one, and the bullet would bounce right back at me. There was no way they could be claw marks, despite what they looked like. Upon closer investigation, I found what looked like to be traces of blood along the scrapes. I took samples to send out to the lab, but I knew it would be a while before we got any results. I didn't have any reasonable explanation for the damage to the tower. I assumed it was made by some heavy machinery to be able to break through the tank, but I didn't know what could have done it, or why, or why no one nearby saw or heard anything during the night. At a complete loss, I headed to my next destination the goat farm. When I got there, the farmer said that at least eight of his goats were missing. They showed me damage to the fence where it appeared something where someone had broken through. He thought it was most likely an animal because a person stealing goats would have just gone through the gate. The fence was only damaged in one area. I didn't notice the correlation, but hindsight is 2020. The broken fence was next to the water though. The water trough itself had been tipped over and moved farther into the paddock. Again, there wasn't anything I could do about the situation, besides file a report. I saved the woman in the trailer for last. I had dealings with her before, and she was always a little bit off. But what else do you expect from a woman living alone in the desert with nothing besides her dilapidated trailer and a tank of exotic fish? I hoped to make the visit as quick as possible and get back to the station. She was ranting and raving at me before I even exited my vehicle. She was barely coherent, but I did catch a few phrases like flying lizard and dragon. I was rethinking my line of work. Sometimes I don't get paid enough for this. I finally got her to calm down and try to explain what was going on. Her story was that some creature she described it as a lizard with wings 
attacked her trailer at night. She said it was nearly the size of the trailer and had claws bigger than her head. Naturally, I didn't believe a single word of it. I assumed she had been on drugs, although she didn't display any typical signs. But then she said something that made my blood run cold. She said the creature tore the water tank off her trailer. I thought back to the water tower and the goat farmer. It was then that I remembered the water tank had been tipped over and thrown around. For whatever reason, this thing was after water. She said the creature tried to break in through her window when it saw her fish. She was convinced it was going to eat them. So she cracked open the door and fired three shots at the beast from her 870. She claims to have hit it, but that it still flew away. I didn't know what to make of her story. I still had a hard time believing it, but I couldn't deny the connection between the three incidents. Something was out there looking for water, and judging by the state of the water tower, that something was certainly capable of extreme strength. But like the last two complaints, there wasn't really anything else I could do except file a report. I did search for blood in the area surrounding the old lady's trailer, but I found nothing. It was nearly a month before the results of the blood from the tower came back from the lab. There wasn't much to go on, but they said the blood was from a reptile, most likely a monitor lizard, but it wasn't an exact match. I don't really know how to explain what's happened, but I'll do my best. Basically, a few months ago, I made contact with something not of this earth. I lead a normal life on the North Fork of Long Island. I'm 28 and live with my girlfriend and our two golden retrievers. I was fortunate in my career at an early age and was able to purchase a home on the North Shore in a very secluded area, far from any neighbors. I mostly work from home and very rarely go into the office in the city. My girlfriend works the night shift so I picked up the habit of staying up late and working through the night so we would have more time to spend together during the day. About four months ago, odd things began happening around my house. Three or four times a week, all the electronics in my house would begin acting haywire. Lights would flicker on and off or grow more illuminated than they should have been. My TV would turn itself on and adjust itself to a channel showing only static. I had an alarm clock radio that would filter through station after station until it too would eventually settle on pure static. Obviously, the first few times this happened, I was completely terrified. Home alone and all my electronics functioning independently was a harrowing experience. All I could think about was that a ghost or entity was inhabiting my home. Unplugging the TV and radio worked but still the lights would flicker, and once in a while, my car would remote start in the garage. But nothing ever dangerous came from it. There was never anything like the movies or scary stories about furniture being flung around, and I was never dragged feet first by any unseen entity. It kind of just kept happening, and somehow I grew accustomed to it. I mean, what else could I do? It never happened when my girlfriend was home, and I took videos on my phone a few times but she just thought I was messing with her. After a few weeks of this, something else happened. It was a typical Wednesday night. My girlfriend would be at work for another six hours. As usual, right around 1 a.m., all of my electronics began to go haywire. Though it seemed to be a little more drastic this time, web browsers were opening on my laptop at an incredible speed. First Google, then several news sites and social medias, this being a new phenomenon, I slammed it shut and manually powered it down with the side button. The lights in each room began to shine incredibly bright, and I heard a bulb shatter in the bathroom. Add to this, two TVs in my house were blasting that horrible static noise at full volume. This was too much for me, and I began panicking. I fled down the steps into my living room and through the back door out on my rear deck. As I flung the door open and ran outside, I felt like I was swallowed up by an incredible blue light. For a moment, I felt weightless, like I was leaving my body behind and floating into the air. Then, 
I didn't feel anything at all. When I regained consciousness, I could barely open my eyes due to another intense light shining down on me. It was the sun riding high in the sky. It must have been later afternoon. I could feel I was laying in the grass and my clothes were drenched in sweat. I tried rising to my feet, but I felt an intense wave of nausea and pain sweep over me. I laid a little while longer and eventually was able to stand up and get my bearings. I was in a familiar clearing, about a quarter mile away from my house. I stumbled my way home, fighting back an expanding headache and trying not to vomit. My girlfriend must have seen me coming up the driveway, and she rushed out to help me walk. I could hear both anger and concern in her voice and allowed her to help me up the stairs into the house. Basically, I had been missing for about 12 hours. My girlfriend had tried calling several times throughout the night and I didn't answer. When she came home, I was nowhere to be found, my cell phone, keys, and wallet all sitting at the kitchen table where I had left them. She said she made a police report, and the officers had promised to send out an APB on me, but a half day isn't a very long time to be missing for. I heard her explain all of this, but all I wanted to do was sleep. I managed to gulp down some toast and water and climbed into bed exhausted and still feeling ill. That sleep and every single one I've had after that was anything but restful. I have the same vision each time I fall asleep. I say vision because it isn't a dream. It's too real to be a dream. I can clearly see and hear everything each time and it never changes. I am in a clean and sterile room with transparent walls and floors. I can't see my body or those of the people around me, but I know others are there. In front of me stands a slim pale figure wearing some form of gray uniform covering it from head to toe, and it delivers a message, the same message every time. Only I can never recall the message upon waking, at least not all of it. I wake up with a sense of overwhelming dread each time. But for the life of me, I can't piece together what this entity is saying. I keep a journal next to my bed and write down the first thing I remember each time. So far, all I managed to piece together is 2028, Gods, Earth, Rebirth, Union, Awakening. I know this all sounds so bizarre. Even my girlfriend doesn't believe me. She keeps begging me to go see a therapist and I'm gonna go, only if to make her happy. Please, if anyone out there knows what this means or has experienced something similar, then please tell me. I want to know that I'm not alone. I had just bought my first house, and I was excited to start living a true adult life. I got a great deal on the property, it was situated on 20 acres of woodland, and the house itself had three bedrooms and two bathrooms. It was my perfect dream home. Almost as soon as I moved out, I decided to get a dog. His name was Asher, and he was a Basset Hound rescue pup. I had been able to spend a few months in the house before things started to get weird, and it all started with Asher. I'm an avid hiker, and I love spending time in nature which is one of the main reasons I love this house. When I was younger, I would hunt with my dad, so I know a thing or two about animal tracks. I'd been walking through the woods with Asher one day, and I noticed some weird tracks in the mud. They almost looked like handprints, which was just a weird thing to see on the ground. I didn't think much of it at the time, so I kept walking. I saw them again a few days later, much fresher looking. I knew whatever had made those tracks was still close by. What concerned me about it was that it looked like they were circling my house. Because there was so much land, I didn't have Asher on a leash. If I let him out, I could just keep an eye on him, and he'd do his business and come right back. That's how we always did it. One night, I was sitting on the couch watching TV, and Asher started scratching at the door. He looked very distressed. I assumed he might have had some GI issues and needed to leave ASAP, so I ran up and let him out. It was silent outside. No wind, no birds, nothing. Asher ran straight into the woods, 
which wasn't normal when I let him out. I called for him, and he didn't come back. I threw on my shoes and ran after him. I tried to listen for any signs of where he was, but I couldn't detect any noise. I'd been running for about five minutes, and I heard him whimpering. I booked it to where the noise was, and I saw Asher limping towards me. I knelt down to see if he was all right, and it looked like he had some scratches on his back legs, but he was having trouble walking. I heard a clicking noise and froze in place. I couldn't figure out where it was coming from exactly, but I didn't want to be there alone. It was something. I picked up Asher and started walking back to the house. All I really cared about at that moment was making sure my dog was safe and cared for, but I heard rustling behind me. It sounded like I was being followed. I quickened my pace and made it back to my house. I shut the door behind me and locked it. I looked back through the window, and all I saw was my reflection because of the light. I turned it off and looked again. In the tree line, I saw this large white thing, sort of glowing in the moonlight. It was walking along the tracks that I had seen before, the ones I thought were circling my house. I kept peering through to try to get a better look at it. I was staring at the one, and I'd seen another one pop into my field of view. This one wasn't obscured by the tree line at all. It was out in the open, walking around my yard, and it looked like it was following my tracks to the house. I ducked down and made sure my door was completely locked as I crawled across the floor. I was just hoping it couldn't see me in the dark. I crouched to the ground, and I started to hear creaking on my porch. It was slow and eerie. Honestly, it felt like it was in a horror movie. Some stuff rattled on the porch like it might have been bumped into or stepped on. When I stopped hearing noises, I slowly moved and peeked through the window. I saw it walking back to the tree line. This thing walked on all fours and was completely white. It looked almost translucent in the moonlight. I could see that it had hands which explained the weird tracks I saw. The creepiest part of all was that it looked human. It had all of the human limbs that I could see, but it walked on all fours. I couldn't figure out what was happening. I waited until morning to go back outside. I took Asher to the vet and had them look at the scratches. After talking to them and seeing them in more detail, I think one of those things tried to grab Asher, but he was able to get away. That was the first time I encountered him. I tried not to go outside alone at night anymore. I hadn't seen them during the day at this point, so I kind of assumed they were nocturnal, but I was wrong. I was walking in my yard around 4 p.m. to take the trash cans to the curb. I was off the road a little ways, so it was a bit of a walk. On the way back, while the sun was still up, I heard the clicking noise again. I heard rustling in the bushes and I ran right back in the house. Asher was barking at the door for a good five minutes while I crouched down below it. I heard the footsteps on the porch again and knew it had followed me home. I feel like I'm trapped in my own house, and I don't know what to do. I was working for New Mexico Game and Fish, doing a study in the northwestern part of the state, monitoring big game populations. We had several collared animals that we were tracking to get a better idea of their habits and range. As a biologist, it was my dream job. Monitoring the big game species was the most interesting to me, but we had quite a coyote problem in the area, so I wound up focusing on that. Coyotes are not a protected species in New Mexico and are oftentimes seen as a pest. We were getting reports of coyotes moving further into the suburban areas, so we decided to do a study. We caught and collared 15 coyotes and planned to track them for a year. One of the issues we were running into was that the housing developments were taking over the coyotes' natural habitats. The other issue was potential overpopulation. Either way, we had to trap and collar these coyotes. I noticed in our study that several of the coyotes were moving into residential areas, but they were avoiding a massive area of land near the reservation that looked like it would be a perfect coyote habitat. When I discovered the pattern, I set out to investigate the area and see what was keeping coyotes out. My theories were 
lack of easily accessible food, or water, or potential predators. There didn't seem to be anything strange about the area. The land was rocky and barren across most of the plains, but that wasn't abnormal for the area. The native plants were thriving and the water sources, although not substantial in the climate, were readily found. However, I didn't see much at all for wildlife. My curiosity got to me, and I decided to set up a game camera near the fresh water sources. Nothing brings desert fauna together like water. If there were any animals to be found out there, the game cameras would catch them. I went back at the end of the week to collect the cameras and review the images. If you don't know how game cameras work, they're motion activated and take a series of photos when the sensor activates. There were a few captures on the camera, but nothing like I would expect. A couple of ringtail, a fox, the thing is, they all looked on edge. Generally, wild animals are always looking over their shoulder. That's the only way they can survive in the world. But there was something else here. I couldn't let it go. I ended up doing a night patrol out there. I drove my truck out there that afternoon and parked close enough to a small fresh water source that should generate some traffic. The desert doesn't really come alive until the evening, so I decided to scout out around the area. I found something that I missed on my first trip out there. Or maybe it wasn't there then, I'm not sure. There were sticks by the edge of the water that were purposefully arranged in some type of pattern. They looked like symbols you'd see on a cave painting, but they were made with sticks. I don't know what they meant or who would even be out there. It looked like it could have been some type of witchcraft if I had to guess. I looked for any footprints around the area or vehicle tracks, and I found nothing besides my own. I camped out in my truck until evening. I had a camera and my notebook with me to record any information I found. It was dead quiet until the sun went down. Out of nowhere, I heard a pack of coyotes screaming. If you've never heard coyotes before, they scream something terrible. It's impossible to mistake them. I'll admit, I was surprised, since all of the coyotes we collared seemed to avoid this place like the plague. The coyote sounded close by. I got out of my truck and tried to get sight of them. They sounded close enough that I should see them any minute. I pointed my flashlight in the direction I thought they were, and the screaming stopped dead. Two lights reflected back at me. They were eyes. I swore they shone red for a moment before turning to silver. It was a coyote, just one. It suddenly started digging when it saw me. I approached it to see if I could scare it off. It darted away from the spot it was digging, but it hung around just at the end of the reach of my light. I walked over to see what it had been digging, and there in the dirt were the letters L-E-A-V-E. -E. I shined my light back at the coyote. It locked eyes with me, and its lips curled up at the corners. I swear to God it smiled. I flashed a quick photo of it I ran back to my truck and got the hell out of there. I don't know what that thing was. I don't want to know what that thing was. I remember its eyes though. It had human eyes. When I went to check the camera, nothing but a white blur showed up in the spot where the coyote should have been. I don't know if I was surprised by that or not. I stopped my coyote study the following week. They were avoiding that area because of that creature, but I couldn't explain it with science, so I reported it as a simple overpopulation. I didn't tell anyone about my experience at the time. Who would believe me? The whole thing sounded absurd, but I have been hearing more stories about strange things going on in the desert. Maybe someone out there knows what I saw or had a similar experience. Ever have a moment when you know you should have listened to everyone? Yeah, me too. Of course, this knowledge doesn't come without some insane story, right? Well, here's mine. I had been convinced to go camping in the badlands of South Dakota. I was never one for camping, but my friends talked me into it. This trip definitely put a nail in that coffin. The Badlands National Park is gorgeous, but in a non-traditional way. The landscape varies, and you feel like you've traveled the entire country when you visit. It seriously is so different. You can see jagged rocky peaks, 
but also acres of prairie. It makes you feel like you've traveled to another world. It's interesting and crazy. Camping here is not for the faint of heart. I still don't understand how I let them talk me into it. I will tell you, it made for a very interesting and unbelievable story. We did very minimal research before heading out. That was an epic mistake. What research was done was literally right outside of the Badlands when we stopped to fill our gas tank and buy snacks. We chatted with the cashier and told them our plans. They quickly warned us. They told us to skip the camping. Go out and enjoy the land, but don't sleep outside. We laughed and told them that we had come all this way to camp, so we're going to camp. We were fools. We spent the day looking at the touristy stuff, the boardwalk to the windows, and the door trail, just to name a few. My buddies were all excited about the camping part. I was not so much. I didn't enjoy sleeping in tents, but it wasn't long before we made camp near Watchdog Butte. Night quickly fell, and we were all sitting around. The full moon was shining, and the clouds had basically disappeared. The sky was beautiful, and made the camping part of the trip worth it. I still wasn't overly excited, but I was coming around fairly quick. We could hear the wildlife starting to emerge. The coyotes were yipping and howling. We could hear small things scurrying around. But we just kept talking and enjoying each other's company, going over where we wanted to start out our next day before we crawled into our sleeping bags. At least, that was our plan. We didn't know that where we chose to sleep was the home to something unnatural. We were laughing and cracking jokes when we first heard it. A scream. At first we thought it was a mountain lion, but it sounded eerily wrong. We couldn't quite figure out why, but we immediately fell silent and began looking around trying to find the source. We just started to calm down and make some jokes about how antsy we were when my friend grabbed my leg and went completely silent. I looked at them and saw that they were staring off towards the watchdog. As their face turned white, I turned to follow their sight, and standing there at the feet of the watchdog was a woman. She was there, but she was blue and see-through. She was gorgeous. As the rest of the group caught on and turned to look, her features started to change. She raised her arm. Her eyes became just gaping black holes, and her mouth dropped open. That wasn't even the most terrifying part. The scream that she released made my blood run cold. I quickly grabbed my ears and scrambled as far back as I could. I watched as I saw my friends all cover their ears also. We had no idea what was going on, but as soon as that screaming stopped, we were tripping over each other trying to get back to the car. Before we could gather our things, we heard something just outside of camp. I didn't wait to figure out if she had gotten any closer. My ears couldn't handle another scream like the one she had just assaulted us with. We raced to gather what we could and threw it into the back of our cars. Not caring about how we were mixing up tent poles, we just wanted out of there immediately. It was as we were finishing loading the last bit up that we heard it. Faint music coming from just outside where we had made camp. We all looked at one another, unsure of what to think about this new development. Was it something to do with the being we had already seen? Was it something else? Was it another camper? I knew that I didn't want to stay and hang out and figure out what it was, so I jumped in my car and turned the key. Everyone had piled into whichever car had an open seat, and we sped out of there. As we neared town, we slowed down. I was leading the convoy, and I didn't want any of us to get a ticket for speeding. I know that I was thinking that surely someone had been playing a trick on us, but we didn't even know anyone, and surely it would be bad for business to scare the tourists. We found a hotel and got a few rooms, but we all filed into one room. None of us wanted to be separated. The events of the night had left us shaken and pretty terrified. We all just kind of fell where we stood, making up where to sit so we could all stay together. It's been years. I haven't ever been back to the Badlands. I don't think that I ever will. What I do know is that when my friends and I get together, we rarely speak of it, and only do so to ensure that we're not crazy, that it really happened. I know that it sounds crazy, I really do. What we went through that night can cause a grown man to pee his pants.
I've always considered myself a daredevil, the friend in the group always willing to take a risk, from bungee jumping off of bridges to finally being able to skydive after my 18th birthday two months ago. I have a taste for adrenaline at all times. So when my friends and I scheduled a camping trip over spring break, wanting to be unplugged for a couple days from reality, there was no fear in my heart about it. Not yet, anyway. California has been my home for as long as I can remember. My family immigrated here from Mexico when I was four years old. El Dorado Hills is the closest thing to home I have ever known and molded me into who I am today. But I never did much traveling besides visiting the grandparents in Mexico yearly. So when my friend and I scheduled a vacation, I was more than excited. Even though it was only an hour away, I couldn't wait to get to the National Forest. So excited, I started packing weeks early and preparing myself mentally for the separation from my best friend for a couple days, my phone. I even bought rods and lures to fish with, despite never having caught a fish in my life. I thought that this trip would be the perfect time to try, plus two of my friends knew how. We also planned to hike trails and ride our bikes and enjoy the scenery, which from the pictures was more than breathtaking. Saturday couldn't come fast enough. The anticipation to be with my friends on my first trip away from my parents was killing me, and them too apparently, because they wouldn't stop talking about it, trying to scare me into changing my mind. In hindsight, they had every right to be worried. The drive to the campground was exhilarating. The landscape was so vibrant clearly untouched by humans. The area was mountainous with lakes and trees and open areas scattered throughout the landscape. I know I said I'm a daredevil, but at this point I began to think I underestimated the size of this forest and my ability to maneuver it. But of course, I didn't tell my friends that. I was the brave one. If I was uneasy, it would rub off on everyone else. So I ignored the rising fear of what or who could be in the forest at night that we couldn't see. On the drive to our spot, we saw a few other cars, but the park was so big, our sights were spread out. We finally made it to our designated area and started setting up the tent so we could explore a little bit before dusk. Had we not been able to hear faded music and laughter from other people, I would have assumed that we were alone. Our swimsuits were already under our clothes, so we grabbed our tackle boxes and poles before heading to the trail near the lake. While walking, I was studying the map and noticed another body of water deeper into the forest. The curiosity got the best of me, and I convinced the group to head there instead. The trail was slightly rugged. California is extremely mountainous, but nothing I can't handle. Less than a mile in, we could hear the water ripple nearby. It wasn't big enough to be a lake, or named on the map like the other ones were, making it all the more exciting. We threw our lines in to see if there were any fish biting. It turns out, fishing is too boring for an adrenaline junkie. I would rather be in the water catching it with my bare hands. I couldn't just stand around staring into the water for another minute. I gave my pole to my friend and I started wandering around instead, looking at the map for our next destination. It wasn't getting dark yet, so I let my friends fish without complaining of boredom. After all, it was my idea to go to this spot instead. They caught a few fish, throwing some back and keeping a few tiny ones for bait. Dusk was slowly closing in, and while possible, it would be difficult to navigate this forest in the dark. We headed to the lake in the opposite direction of our campsite, this time to swim and maybe ride a kayak or whatever we could find. We swam for about 30 minutes or so. As the sun began to set, we watched it from the lake's edge. That was our signal to start heading back to our site. We gathered our belongings while dreading the walk back. As we were heading back, it was much quieter than the walk there, and the calmness I felt before turned to anxiety. After five minutes of walking, I was almost stopped dead in my tracks by a putrid stench. It smelled like we were walking into my high school football team's locker room after a game, or a dumpster full of sweltering garbage. I immediately blamed it on one of my friends, needing to bathe after our swim. But everyone had the same confused reaction I did. The scent came out of nowhere. We stopped and tried to find the source. 
smelling each other's armpits and looking in our bags and even the tackle boxes, finding nothing. We laughed about the situation, blaming it on someone leaving old trash at their site before leaving. Then we heard three loud, bellowing yelps that sounded fairly close to us. Stunned, we all looked in different directions to see where it was coming from. There was nobody at the nearby sites or on the trail with us. We assumed it was the older kids we saw at the lake. Almost to our campsite, we saw an enormous reddish-brown creature standing at least eight feet tall walking through the trees. It wasn't fat, but strong-looking with broad shoulders perfect for a football player. But this thing was far from being human, let alone a football player. The closest comparison I can make to this creature is a bear, but even bears would not have been able to walk upright so perfectly. Regardless, I didn't stick around to analyze it, because before I knew it, my fight or flight kicked in, and I was running in the opposite direction. Panting from exhaustion back at the campsite, there was no need for discussion. We immediately packed a tent up and left. To a friend's house. Not to go home, of course. I'd rather let the creature heat me than have to admit to my parents that they were right. I won't be the first person to tell you a version of this story. I'm sure you've heard one like it. If you haven't, please sit back for a moment and try to give me the benefit of the doubt. Point Pleasant comes up in these stories often, doesn't it? I know it does, because I've done the research. If my account wasn't backed up by others, I wouldn't be sharing it now. Anyway, you guessed it. Point Pleasant is where my story takes place. Just north of there is a forest reservation for fish and game. That land has to be managed by somebody. And for a few years, I was the lucky park service member with their boots stuck in Point Pleasant's mud. You see, the forest there isn't exactly worth the hike. During World War II, those 8,000 acres were the base of an ammunition manufacturing facility. The explosives developed there were kept in above-ground bunkers hidden under a layer of dirt and grass. Those bunkers covertly populate the landscape, like houses in the Shire. When the land was abandoned after the war, the explosives left behind in those bunkers began to contaminate the surrounding area. Some of the structures have been known to explode without warning, even though the land is hospitable enough to cater to the occasional hunter or fisherman. Much of it is still considered a national priority for hazardous waste. It was my job to walk the area, check for signs of trespassing, and to navigate any reports of activity around the bunkers. It sounds a bit ridiculous, I know, who would go wandering around these little igloos of toxicity? You'd be surprised. I chased my fair share of photographers, social media wannabes, and conspiracy theorists. If I regret giving any of them a hard time, it's that last group. There is something going on in Point Pleasant, after all. I saw it. A photographer, who actually got the clearance from the proper authorities, came to me one morning with an image that he demanded I see. He had set up some unwieldy remote cameras around a few of the bunkers. His goal, as far as I understood it, was to take several pictures throughout the course of the day, from the comfort of his van and laptop. He was creating a time lapse or some other artistic concept that I honestly couldn't be bothered with. He was obeying my safety instructions, and that was all I could really ask for. The picture he showed me, however, was very bothersome. It was the still image of a pale, naked man running behind one of the bunkers. He was only visible from the elbows down, since his head and shoulders were already behind the structure. The rest of his physique was too blurry to make out. He must have been sprinting across the frame when the photographer snapped the picture. Most concerning was the large black bag slung across his back. My heart started racing the moment I saw it. If there was anything remotely explosive in that bag, the stranger could start a chain reaction that would destroy 8,000 acres of land. I called for backup first. A naked man with a black bag didn't exactly inspire urgency in the rest of the park service. They were on the way, but I needed to take point. Luckily, I knew exactly where that bunker was. I left the photographer behind 
and hurried to hopefully defuse the situation before it got out of hand. When I arrived there, however, it wasn't a man waiting for me. It was something else. The muscular, pale, humanoid body was squatting atop the bunker. He had climbed up it for some reason. The body cut off at its head, its shoulders smoothed out where a neck should have been. I can clearly see two red eyes. I couldn't comprehend what I was seeing. I still don't understand it, not fully. All I know is that I did see it. I wasn't hallucinating. I wasn't dreaming. I know that because it was the photograph that lured me out first. I guess my mind didn't have a reference point to compare the creature to anything remotely normal. How could it live without a head? Could it even see with its eyes so low on its body? Then the black shape on its back, which I had mistakenly identified as a bag, started to unfurl. Large, black, feathered wings. They must have sprouted almost 20 feet from tip to tip. I don't know how to explain it but I felt like I was looking at something divine. I'd never seen a creature that big before. I'd never felt so small in the face of something that I couldn't comprehend. I'm sure that I was shaking, but I don't remember much of how my body reacted. I don't know if I yelled or whimpered, or if a cold sweat broke out on my back. I only remember being frozen by the awesome dread. Then it leaped straight up. It flew into the air at some incredible speed. I only heard its wings beat once, then it was gone. My backup eventually arrived and found me still standing there, still staring. I tried to explain, but quickly shut up when they started to check me for signs of injury. The footprints were atop the bunker. I thought that should have been enough proof. Clawed feet or talons, something big. The prints were brushed aside. I was hopeful still that the photographer's picture would lend some credibility to my case. Not so. The picture only looked like a man. It didn't convince a single person that I had seen some monster out in the woods. Not even the photographer himself believed me. He wouldn't give me a copy of the photograph. He didn't want to enable my delusions, I guess. I don't know that I blame him. I was let go not long after that. Now, I guess it's my duty to tell this story. Please. If you know what's good for you, don't go wandering around Point Pleasant. I take an annual trip up north to Algonquin Provincial Park in southeastern Ontario, Canada. It's beautiful up there and still pretty wild and rugged. It's something like over 2,900 square miles with lakes and rivers. It's truly fantastic great place to get away from the city. The sky at night is just nothing but stars. The air is fresh and clean, and you can see all sorts of wildlife to boot. I have pictures of moose and deer. There's a few with bear and some fox, many with birds. Now, there is wolves up there, but I've never seen them, only heard them at night. If you set out of your campsite and hear them, you can howl back at them and they will answer. It's a great experience. Some people think it's a little eerie or creepy, but I think it's one of those life-changing experiences. Now, I was supposed to go up there with my son-in-law last year, but he had to cancel at the last minute. Something about work, a project or something got changed. I'm not really sure. He works at some ad agency. I don't really know what he does. Anyway, he was supposed to go up and stay the week with me, but since he canceled, I decided I was going to go and stay a little longer, about two weeks. It's an eight plus hour drive to get up there. People think I'm crazy just for the drive up. I tell them it's absolutely worth it. I'll even bust out my pictures trying to convince them. I don't really want to say where I live, so I'll just say I live in a state that borders Canada. Is that odd? I don't think it's odd. Anyway, I left my house at 2 a.m. Absolutely no traffic on the highway or in the city at that time. Makes traveling much easier. The drive is not bad. Just a lot of open highway, farmland, cities, and towns here and there. You go through Windsor and London. And then finally, about four or five hours in, you hit Toronto. 
that's when the traffic picks up and you get stuck in the congestion of the freeway. I usually stop for food in Toronto, something fast, then I continue on. Past Toronto, it's rest stops in small towns until you get to the park. There's a store right outside the campgrounds that I usually stay. So I'll stop there for supplies that I've either forgotten or just didn't buy before the trip. It's a nice small place, friendly people, and stocked with foods and camping gear. It's about 15 or 20 minutes to the campgrounds. I set up my site. I'm a tent camper myself. I like the old traditions, you know? One large tent for sleeping, one smaller one for provisions, and my bike, and canoe equipment, and portable fridge. The site has access to electricity, though not all of them do. Some have no access to electricity or even bathrooms. You can go completely rugged if you want there, though I never have. I have even stayed there at one of the lodges near the park when it was fall. One of the first things I like to do is hike up my favorite trail that leads to a series of bluffs. There's something like 2,000 feet above sea level. They're well wooded, and most of the trails are pretty long. You can get lost for hours on them. It's really fantastic. The sun was low in the sky, but it was a bright, clear day. I saw some deer on the way up, which is not an uncommon sight for the park. I got to the top of the highest point of the bluff, and it looks out over miles of forest and river. It's truly breathtaking, you know, like something out of a movie. So I began to take pictures. I do every time I go up. There's always something new. I'm taking pictures of the forest below when I hear someone call out. I see a couple about 10 feet from me and they're pointing out. I look up and there's this shining ball in the sky. It's a yellowish orange in color and it's just hanging there. I go to shoot it with my camera and two more appear right below it, kind of making a triangle shape. They're just hovering there. I start taking pictures and the balls begin to move slowly and get bigger, like maybe they're moving closer to us. I'm not really sure though. It's hard to tell with things moving in the sky like that. I've seen birds I thought were much bigger than they actually are. I take a few shots and then all of a sudden the damn things fly off in a blank. I mean these things were really moving. I look at the couple and they look at me and we just kind of look around in disbelief, you know? My camera died right after that too, maybe a minute after the lights took off. I have some pictures, but some are blurry. I must not have been too steady when I was trying to take them. I don't know what I saw. I tried talking to the park rangers, and I talked with a couple that was out there with me. They tried to get some pictures on their phones, but they were much too blurry. My son says it was probably a plane, or a few planes, maybe military jets. The ranger said the park isn't on a flight path. I don't know. I don't want to believe the crazy theories or anything, but I also can't explain what I saw. It's the damnedest thing. I've returned to the park since. I always will, but I've never seen anything like that again. I've asked people what they've seen in the park, but it's mostly wildlife stories. Nothing like what I got pictures of. I don't know what to think, really. I encountered a cold-blooded creature and survived to tell the tale. I was 20 years old and bored out of my mind in my hometown, so I decided to move to Colorado. It was my first time ever living alone, and although I was excited about my newfound freedom, I was a bit scared. I had only been living in my new apartment for a week and realized I needed to unpack a few more things from a box I left in storage in the basement. I dreaded going down there. It was dingy and dark and looked like a room out of a horror movie. I made my way down and shifted through a few boxes. There was another person who entered the basement and I glanced up only for a moment and noticed it was a girl around my age. I was new to the area and eager to make new friends, so I struck up a conversation with her. She was super friendly and had beautiful, glossed over eyes and pale skin. We got to talking and I ended up inviting her over for dinner later that evening. After she got what she needed from down there, she waved by and ascended up the stairs. 
I was excited about a potential new friend. Only thing was, I didn't have much groceries. The way back up to my room, I kept contemplating what dish to cook up for us. After I examined my pantry, I found some pasta sauce, noodles, and some frozen garlic bread in my freezer. It wasn't anything glamorous, but I was sure I could spruce it up enough. The day dragged on and finally I started prepping dinner. I just popped the bread in the oven and heard a knock on the door. I quickly went over to answer it and greeted her. She looked around past me and glanced at her feet. I thought maybe she wanted to take her shoes off, so I told her she could take her shoes off and come inside. She smiled and entered, then closed the door behind her. I poured her some wine and told her it was ready. We conversed for a few minutes before I realized the bread was still in the oven. I took it out and let it cool while I served us the pasta. She sat at the table while I brought over the bread. I playfully wafted the plate of bread by her face, saying, oh, it's nice and warm. She let out a shriek, and her cheek sparked a flame. I dropped the plate on the table, apologizing, thinking it had touched her cheek and burned her. I got her a cool towel while she covered her cheek with her hand. I kept apologizing, and she told me it was fine, just had a garlic allergy. I felt terrible. My first attempt at making friends, and this happens, I ended up getting her a band-aid and she wore it on her cheek. We conversed while we ate and she told me how she was born in England and moved to the States when she was very young. We talked for a few hours and laughed a lot. I took her on a tour of my apartment and showed her artwork I had painted. She loved a few of my pieces and even offered to buy one to hang in her place. She was intrigued by a painting I was still working on and offered me money for it. I couldn't charge her for it, but instead I told her I would finish it and bring it over to her place the next day. We parted ways for the night, and as soon as she left, I got to work on the piece. I wanted to make sure the piece was perfect and stayed up all night working on it. I was so excited to bring her the painting. I went out and grabbed breakfast for us and went to her place around 9 a.m., I knocked on her door, and it squeaked open, like she forgot to close it all the way. I called out, and entered, closing the door behind me. All of her windows were covered by heavy drapes, so I turned the light on. I set my things down on her dining room table and took a look around. Her place was super clean. I called out for her again, but heard nothing. I made my way around the corner to the room and saw a large coffin. I thought that was extremely odd and went to examine it further. I couldn't see much and the light switch wasn't working, so I pushed back the curtains. My curiosity got the best of me and I cracked open the coffin. I pushed it up and saw her laying there. Oh my God, are you okay? I said. She shot up and the light pierced her skin and her arm flamed up. She squealed out and two fangs emerged from her mouth. She rushed over, closing the curtains, and glared at me. I don't know what happened or what this girl was. I stood there, shaking, and my eyes fixated on her fangs. She caught my gaze and retracted them back. She calmed herself and told me to follow her into the living room. My feet didn't want to move. I was frozen. She knew I was scared, so she leaned on the coffin. I'm not someone you need to fear. I won't harm you, she said. At this point, I was still in shock and couldn't comprehend what was happening. She sighed and told me I should leave. It's like when my ears heard that, my feet quickly carried me to the door. I went back to my place and sat in silence until the afternoon. I had time to think and had so many questions. I decided to go back and find out more. When I got back to her apartment, the door was wide open and everything was gone, even the painting I left her. All that remained was a note on her counter with a $100 bill inside that said, I'll keep this for centuries to come.